Good evening and welcome to Freedom is a Constant Struggle with your host, Kilu Nyasha. And on the controls is Sydney Matterson. My get very special guest today is Jeffrey Blankford. But before I introduce him, I want to share with you a press release regarding the uh, national and international call for medical intervention for political prisoner Mumia Abu Jamal, diagnosis and immediate treatment from outside physicians. The need for independent medical diagnosis and treatment for renowned political prisoner Mumia Abu Jamal is urgent. An open letter was delivered on April 29th to Pennsylvania Governor Thomas Wolfe and Department of Corrections Secretary John Wetzel in Harrisburg documenting the medical neglect and malpractice that has characterized Abu Jamal's treatment. Over a period of four months, Abu Jamal's initial skin problem, diagnosed by the prison doctors as eczema, deteriorated drastically and his health condition became life-threatening from undiagnosed diabetes as he went into diabetic shock in the prison. Participants in the press conference will reiterate the call to Governor Wolf and Secretary Wetzel to immediately allow outside doctors of Abu Jamal's choosing to conduct the proper diagnosis and treatment to save his life. Supporters of Abu Jamal note that the horrific medical care he has received at SCI Mahoney with serious consequences is by no means unique to him. They call for an independent investigation of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections medical system. They note that this investigation must focus in particular on profit-making organizations hired by the Department of, of Corrections that place priority on cost-cutting rather than the quality of care provided to the prisoners. Fewer referrals to hospitals are made and deaths increase. Finally, given the extensive evidence of Abu Jamal's innocence, long prevented from being addressed fairly in the courts, and now the evidence that his very life is in danger while in the prison system, the letter calls for Abu Jamal's immediately, immediate release from prison. Signers of the letter include Archbishop Desmond Tutu, former Attorney General Ramsey Clark, former President of the UN General Assembly, Father Miguel Descoto, Danny Glover, and Alex Wa Alice Walker. Uh, the contact is Dr. Susan Ross, 917-584-2135. And I want to call your attention to uh, the uh, effort to make Malcolm X uh, birthday a national holiday. May 19th, the birthday of Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, uh, uh, in San Francisco, is part of an international effort to declare May 19th uh, an official holiday. The day celebrates Malcolm's life, work, ideology, and leadership whose relevance to American society remains as meaningful and important today as it was during his lifetime. Mal Malcolm X Day San Francisco will be celebrated in San Francisco's Bayview District on Sunday, May 17th, with free outdoor music and guest speakers. Performers will include local rappers and poets, Selassie, Talia Monet, Jabari Shaw, and Ross Ceylon, Community-owned restaurants will serve free food. The event is dedicated to raising awareness of Malcolm X Day and seeking positive solutions for some of the current challenges faced by San Francisco residents, gentrification, unemployment, and poverty in the context of the principles and life work of Malcolm X, unity and self-determination. The event is from 1 to 4 at Kenneth Harding Plaza, also known as Mendel Plaza, 3rd and Palou in San Francisco. That Sunday afternoon will be one of several Bay Area weekend events honoring 
Malcolm X. We hope you'll consider supporting Malcolm X Day San Francisco. Thank you. And now I'm happy to bring to you my very special guest, um, Jeffrey Blankford, who's uh, not only a, a special guest, but a dear friend. We go back, uh, God, over 20 years, over, right? Over 20 years, yes. Well, over 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> and we were colleagues at Pacifica, KPFA, yes. and KPO. Oh, oh. That's right. So, uh, That's right. We've been through some struggles together. Yes. And more to come. <laughs> right. So, Jeffrey Blankford is a photojournalist, writer, and radio producer. He currently hosts a twice-monthly program on international affairs for KZYX, the public radio station for Mendocino County in Northern California, where he now lives. His articles have been published in Counterpunch, Dissident Voice, Left Curb, The Washington Post on Middle East Affairs, and the Encyclopedia of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, among others. Since the 1960s, his photographs have, have appeared in major publications in the U.S. and around the world, and we'll share a few of those with you. During his, this past Black History Month, an exhibit of his photos of the Black Panthers and Palestinians was on display at the African American Art and Cultural Complex in San Francisco. Blankford's first trip to Lebanon and Jordan in 1970 was to take photos for a book titled Palestine, the Arab-Israeli Conflict, published by Ramparts Press in 1972. That trip led to his involvement in the Palestinian cause. He became a founding member of the November 29th Committee on Palestine, a co-founder of the Labor Committee on the Middle East, and editor of its publication, The Middle East Labor bulletin from 1988 to 1995. This past April 10th, he was a speaker at an all-day conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., devoted to the impact of the Israeli lobby on American politics. His subject was the nationwide spying operation of the Anti-Defamation -Def League, which he helped to expose in San Francisco in 1993 with his successful lawsuit against the ADL for spying on him and two others. One of Blankford's main concerns has been to call attention to, its abusive pop to the abuse of power of the Israel lobby and his disagreements with Professor Noam Chomsky, who minimizes the lobby's influence on American policy. He's written two critical articles on Chomsky's, Chomsky's approach to this issue. Some of Blankford's photos can be seen on his website, www.jeffblankfordphotography.com. All one word, jeffblankfordphotography.com. And welcome to Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Jeffrey, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you to be back, back. here, Keelu. Yes, right. it's been a while. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, uh, let's, uh, you want to share some of the photos? Be happy to. Let's do that first. And um, we'll, um, we'll share some of the photos that Jeffrey has taken over the years. Uh, Jeff, I'll let you. Yeah, this first them. photo. I took in East Jerusalem in a hospital in 1983. Uh, there were 12, 12, excuse me, there were six children in the hospital, Palestinian children, who lost their uh, legs in Lebanon during Israel's invasion in 1982, and they were having prosthesis fit. Uh, there, of the six children there, they only had two legs among them. And I went to photograph them, and I almost burst into tears when I saw them, but they were smiling, and I took photographs, of, which I sent back to them. But um, this photograph was taken in the, in the lobby of that, that hospital. Israel used so many cluster bombs in 1982 that uh, President Reagan ordered them not to use any more, and the U.S. stopped shipment of cluster bombs to Israel in 1982. In 2006, Israel was dropping cluster bombs their own uh, in Lebanon, and before they evacuated, they dropped thousands more in southern Lebanon, and these are designed to hurt civilians, and particularly children who pick them up. These They look like they look toys. Like toys of course. The U.S. used these in Vietnam, and uh, Israel and, followed and suit. Still, yeah. uh, and Saudi Arabia has been using them in Yemen. 
Yeah, and I was about to say in Vietnam, uh, you know, they just um, uh, commemorated the end of the war, uh, 40th year, um, um, and uh, it, a lot of uh, information was coming out about the current situation in Vietnam, and apparently people people are still stepping on landmines that were planted. 40 years ago. In, both in Vietnam and in Laos. Right. And the United States has never apologized to Vietnam for launching an uh, unprovoked war. Of course. Uh, did not pay reparations. Right. And uh, kept Vietnam uh, under sanctions for years. It, it, uh, and now it's turned out to be a, a source of cheap labor for American and European Factories, uh, I know. textile factories. I know, it's terrible. Um, this one here, this is a photograph. We go of the, the Black Panthers from Los Angeles uh, in Defremery Park and in, in Bobby Hutton Park in Oakland in 68. On the far right there, uh, leading and giving orders to the Panthers of LA is John Huggins, who would then be shortly after that be murdered. Uh, in Los Angeles at UCLA. He was a UCLA student, and he was murdered there by uh, a member of something called Us or United Slaves. Um, there was belief that COINTELPRO, the FBI, was behind that. Oh, they they, they admitted to being yeah. behind that. This is a picture I took at the Sabra camp in Palestine, excuse me, in Lebanon in 1983. Uh, it's one of my favorite pictures because this young, the, the place was largely wiped out. But the young boy on the right was obviously the, the leader of this group. I mean, everyone was looking at him, so I kind of like that picture. This was we're back to the Panthers. Um, this was taken in front of the Alameda Courthouse during one of the protests um, for Huey Newton to free Huey Newton, the founder, one of the co-founders of the Panthers. What's important about this picture is the Panthers inspired uh, groups and other um, so-called minority groups to organized themselves, and like the Brown Berets in the Latino community, Iwar Kuhn in the Red Guard in the Asian American community. And here is a, a Brown Beret standing in solidarity with Black Panthers at the Alameda Courthouse. I think this is, this is important because people didn't know that there was a solidarity between groups. Um, and you, you, any more photos? Is that, okay, well that, is that it? Yeah, that's good. Oh, okay. That's a good start. Anyway, okay. there are more on my website, jeffblankfordphotography.com. Right. You'll see pictures from the 60s, uh, uh, a whole variety of things over the last 50, 60 years that I've been taking photographs of. Right, yes, yeah. yes. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the whole business of the Israeli lobby because, um, you know, it's, it's my understanding, and I've known this for years, that... Uh, if you uh, support Palestine or if you uh, uh, disparage the Israel Israel in any way, uh, you're not going to let you're not gonna, not going to get a seat in Congress. And if you already have one, you're not going to keep it. Yes, uh, this is the sine qua non of American politics, whether you're Democrat or Republican in the major party, and it it really doesn't matter what your personal feelings are. Uh, when you go to run for Congress, and you're a Democrat or Republican, somebody from APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which ironically is not required to register as a foreign agent, but is the most effective foreign agent, um, among another, uh, all the leading foreign agents in this country are in fact working for Israel, but APAC sends somebody to your office and they ask you to make a statement supporting Israel. And if you don't want to make one yourself, they will write one for you. So whether it's Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Warren has no public interest in, in Israel, but she, her statement supporting Israel and the bombing of Gaza in, in last year was just out of the Israeli playbook, the AIPAC playbook. And, and that's not surprising because that's where it came from. Uh, you simply cannot expect to get any funding. You're a Democrat or Republican, uh, whether you're black or Latino, it doesn't matter. Uh, all of the, the members of the Congressional Black Caucus 
who have supported Palestine in the past, one after another, have been targeted for defeat successfully. The last one being Cynthia McKinney. Right, and, and then what, there was yeah, the and what they would do Earl is they would not only send money in from outside, but they would get Uncle Tom's uh, collaborators within the black community to run against her to or, right. or, 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 or sorry, cases a man to siphon all votes. Right. Now, the same thing is happening to Donnie Edwards now in Maryland, who has said some favorable things for the Palestinians. And so she's running against someone who is in bed with the Israel lobby. And she just denounced a flyer that was put out exposing this guy. And she has just decided that she has to play the game as well. John Conyers did once speak out for the Palestinians. He learned to keep his mouth shut. He doesn't do that anymore. That's right. Matter of fact, in 1973, you probably haven't heard this, but a leading uh, member of the Jewish community, Arthur Hertzberg, met with the young Charles Rangel, the New York's long-serving yes, representative, I'm very and they made a deal. The deal was this: that the pro-Israel community would support welfare for the black community as long as the black caucus would not criticize Israel and support everything issued that pertained to Israel. And that's why during Israel's collaboration with South Africa, the Black Caucus was silent. Even when it came out that they were selling weapons to South Africa, even when Israel and South Africa did a joint atomic weapons test in 1989, not a word. And one person who objected to that was, um, he was from Trinidad, uh, Mervyn Dimely. Right. And they went after Mervyn Dimely. Uh -huh. And I wanted to interview him after he got out of office, but he was even afraid to do it then, right. to find out how they work. Uh, it's really something. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. You really can't work within this system. And, you, and it's a taboo, not only in the mainstream media talking about this, but on the alternative media. Uh, Noam Chomsky, as I've written and, di and, and disc uh, excuse me, documented, uh, dismisses the role of the lobby. He says it's, it's, it only goes through an open door. It doesn't have any kind of influence. So when Netanyahu came and invited by the Republicans to speak to Congress, a joint session of Congress, without notifying the president... They just this, bypassed the president. That's bypassed a, the president, that but was this shows diss. the lobby's power and a program like Democracy Now!, which does a lot of good work on other subjects, brought Chomsky in, and Chomsky simply dismissed this as, as Netanyahu being supporting the hawks in Congress, and then after the speech was over, there was nothing about it on her program. And yet this was recognized within Israel by his critics of the, of the Israel lobby in Israel. For example, Gideon Levy said, is, U.S. has given up its sovereignty. This is the United States of Israel. It's, it's like the, the tail wagging the dog. It's the tail wagging the dog, and the problem is is it such a taboo that the movement, so-called movement, the progressive movement, doesn't want to touch the subject. This is why we've had these conferences the last two years in Washington. We have former CIA people, people have been, who know what was going we on, ex-congressmen and so on, um, and not a single word in the, in the mainstream media or on Democracy Now! Right. Or in the nation, or right. you know, Mother Jones. It's like you don't want to talk about this issue because this issue is so important. Right, which makes me, which made me think of uh, the article that's appearing in Counterpunch today, uh, May seventh, uh, that you wrote. Uh, oh, talk the, about, about right. Uh, Tom Hayden was, of course, people remember Tom Hayden as being one of the important leaders of the Students for, non uh, students for Democratic Society, SDS, one of the most important activists against the war in Vietnam. He actually, being before that, he worked did a lot of great work in the Newark ghetto. But he decided in 1982 that he was going to now have a political career. And so he was going to run for assembly in Santa Monica, which is a substantial Jewish community. And in order to run in that district, he felt, well, he was actually told by the political machine of Michael Berman and his brother in the Congress, Howard Berman, and actually until a couple of years ago, they were the ones who would redraw the maps of congressional districts in California. This 
one office for Michael Berman until the voters voted to have an independent commission. They told him what he had to do. Now, Hayden pretended he was naive, but he wasn't naive. He had fought against the war. He had, he had led a demonstration in Chicago in 1968 against the Democrats. He knew what this country was capable of right. and was, was doing. He had been to Vietnam. And yet, in order to get elected, he goes over to Israel with Jane Fonda, Israel's wife at the time. Who was his wife at the time. Who, who the time. And Israel is now, at the time, besieging Beirut. This we're is, talking early 80s. We're talking in the uh, summer of, of 1982. Israel has invaded Lebanon with 80,000 troops, an unprovoked invasion, right. breaking, breaking a, a, a truce that the U.S. had negotiated between the PLO and Israel, which Israel had continuously provoked the PLO, and the PLO had not responded. Palestinian but, Liberation Organization. Right. They went, Palestine Liberation Organization. And so PLO is in Beirut, and the Israeli army is besieging Beirut. And there are Jane and Tom observing the shelling going on in the civilian neighborhoods. I was there in 83, and I saw what the shelling had done. And then they go back to Israel, and they make statements. Of, Jane gets shown, Tom gets shown in embracing Israeli soldiers in hospitals. Right, and isn't that uh, when uh, uh, Saber and Shatila took place? No, uh, two, yeah, two months later, Saber and Shatila took place. Two, yeah. And and then Hayden comes back, he goes on KPFK in Los Angeles, he goes on KPFA, defending his positions, he writes articles and talking about how wonderful Israel is and that Israel and the U.S. have these shared values and this shared history of democracy, all this nonsense... Now he knows. It's not like he's naive. He knows, but he had said the same. He had been criticizing Well, right after policy. he said it, as you said, two months later, Saber and Shatia, yeah. when Israel sent the, what was the Falange? Uh, they, so, they, Ariel Sharon allowed the Falange, the, these right-wing fascists, to come in and massacre uh, between two and 3,000 Palestinians. Yes. The, the, the I'll men, never forget the that. The men had already left because horrible. the U.S. had negotiated a deal that the Palestinian fighters would leave Beirut and they went to Tunisia. And so there were no men left in the refugee camps to defend the Palestinians. And so Sharon let them come in. Who they called the Butcher of Baghdad. The Butcher of butcher Beirut. Oh, Beirut. Beirut. <laughs> Sorry. And, um, and what the Israeli army did was they had Israeli soldiers block the entrances to both the, to the camps. They provided food for the killers who were committing the massacres, and flares, flares so they could continue the murder during the night, and then bulldozers to help bury bodies. And there are those who said some Israeli soldiers participated. I don't know about that, but I do know the other things were true. And, and so Sharon was forced to resign as defense minister because of his complicity with Saber Chatil in Israel. But then he turned around and came back and was from, became from, uh, the prime, minister. prime minister. But then Sharon comes to the United States as a hero to the Jewish community here, and they fill his pockets with, with, with money. I know, so it was disgusting. It isn't a, you know, it, it's a pretty ugly history, but it's something people don't want to talk about. So anyway, Hayden served 18 years in the, in the Assembly and the Senate. So at 2000, he finished with a Senate career. And he actually tried to be an L.A. city councilman, but he didn't make it. So then he's trying to recreate himself. He founded something called the Council for Economic Democracy right. in California and used that as a stepping stone um, to run for the assembly in, in, in Santa Monica. So 18 years go by. So excuse me. I'm, 18 years go by. 2000, he's now out of the Senate. 2006, he has some other plans. I'm sorry. If the CED was earlier than that, he had some other plans. And so he writes an article for Truth Dig, an online uh, journal, explaining how he had been duped by the Israeli lobby. He had been forced by the Berman, Michael Berman and Howard Berman machine to go to Israel and do all these things. He had, been, he had to do that because this is what he had to do to get elected. And he doesn't, but he doesn't say this until three decades after it happened, <laughs> uh, or actually, no, twenty, no, twenty-four years 
after after that he writes the article and but he doesn't apologize he says it was a mistake it was a mistake of my political career but it wasn't a mistake it, 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 he benefited from it but right. if he if he had criticized Israel at that time like any decent human being would have done and some of his credentials would have done he never would have been elected to office for real so he sold out and that's why uh, Alexander Coburn writing in the Village Voice wrote there are 46 portraits of Benedict Arnold in the National Gallery in Washington none of them look alike yet they all resemble Tom Hayden <laughs> and Gore Vidal said he gives opportunism a bad name. And here he is again. He's just written a book on Cuba. He spent a number of sessions with Ricardo Alacón, the Cuban um, diplomat, and he's written a book called Listen Yankee, Cuba Matters, and he's now promoting himself again to be some kind of a people hero uh, or someone prominent on the left. He also, of course, was the founder of Progressives for Obama, which... I won't comment on that for the moment. You see, but he not only in 2008, but he did it again in 2012. It's, it's not progressive an Obama, an oxymoron, but anyway. Yeah, it is an oxymoron. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the point is, is that if he had, instead of going to Israel, if he had gone to Soweto, if he had, and, and stood with his South African soldiers as they massacred students in Soweto, do you think he'd be accepted in polite company and anywhere in the left? But no, he, he is, you have a situation where the Zionist influence within the movement, soft core, hard core, whatever, is such that he, he didn't pay any price for that trip to Israel. The Nation magazine, he was on, the, I, he, two years later, he was on a program with the Deidre English of Mother Jones and the Nation New Republic, the Democratic Socialists of America. All these folks, they were happy to be with him because what he did went to Israel was not serious enough. Let's talk about yeah. Israel and yeah. what Israel is yeah. doing, Jeff. And uh, one of the, the most egregious uh, things that they did, uh, of course, was uh, in their at the, the in two, uh, 2005, I believe. No, 2014. Um, I'm thinking of the first. Well, um, there, are there are three. Three, three intifadas. Three, three, <laughs> but three this third, in yeah, this third uh, attack was last year. You're right. And uh, it was a monster. Two thousand uh, Palestinians were killed. Among those were hundred, at least five hundred children, because practically half the population is under eighteen. Yes. Uh, uh, in that live in Gaza, um, uh, it's an, literally an open air prison. And uh, the, the uh, Israelis were bombing the hell out of it. And uh, we have uh, um, some footage that, w let's share some of yeah. that so people can get uh, an idea of, of just how vicious uh, yeah, this the Israeli the government the uh, and, uh, it it can be. It wasn't a war, actually. It was a massacre. Yes, yeah, of course. Not a war is now, international calls are mounting on Israel to show restraint and stop shelling civilians in Gaza, but the country apparently isn't ready for peace just yet, saying there's more to come in Operation Protective Edge. More than 90 Palestinians, mostly civilians, have been killed and hundreds injured in the offensive so far. At least 20 of those who lost their lives are children. The audience will hear. <laughs> Israel says it hit more than 100 targets in Gaza on Thursday. Many of the missiles have landed in residential areas, causing panic to ripple through the population. Journalist Harry Fear met those caught up in the violence as they brace themselves for yet more air raids. On a visit to Gaza's main hospital, we met four-year-old Shema al-Masri. She was injured in her abdomen. She became collateral damage in a drone strike. The girl went to visit her sister with her parents. On the road, they came under missile fire. When she tried to avoid one, she was hit by a second. Her mother and brother were killed. She and her sister were left in a critical condition. 
Her sister died today, and the girl is still under God's care. No one knows if she's going to make it. Doctors tell me they've been dealing with a biting shortage of medical supplies in Gaza for the last three weeks as a result of the ongoing siege. But even civilians that survive the violence suffer the mental effects of living in a war zone. Abed lives in a neighborhood of Sheikh Radwan that was targeted last night. We were sitting by the entrance when the first missile hit the house and the second one soon followed. We carried the sleeping children out and ran away. The children began screaming through fear. In Gaza, dozens of Palestinians have been killed. In Israel, no one has been killed. As in recent years, this Hamas-Israel war is far from symmetrical in terms of casualties and civilian loss. It's been a traumatizing couple of days for the civilians of Khan Yunus in the south of the Gaza Strip, too. During its operation, Israel says that it's going after Hamas militants, those that it alleges are Hamas militants. However, it's willing to go as far as targeting their homes. And in this case, Israel killed six children and two adults when it struck this family home. The family didn't have time to heed the warning drone missile, which arrived four minutes before the main strike. We were shocked when a missile hit my brother's house. After we hurried out, our house was hit too. By the house was a children's playground where most of the hits came. Israel has made clear that it's not interested in restraining its operation on Gaza so long as Hamas rocket fire continues. It's a recipe for further conflict and inevitable suffering for Gaza's civilian population. A population already so beleaguered now lives in fear of even more violence in the coming days. Harry Fear, RT, Gaza. Meanwhile, clashes have erupted between Palestinians and Israeli soldiers in the West Bank city of Bethlehem. Teenagers had been throwing rocks at the troops who fired tear gas to disperse them. Israel's actions in Gaza have forced Egypt to open its border with Palestine and take in the most seriously wounded at a local hospital. For its part, Israel has vowed to step up attacks on Gaza until Hamas stops firing into its territory. Several months. Okay, we're back. So, Jeffrey, will you comment on uh, the what they call the Operation Protective Edge? It, I, most of what I could say, obviously, may not be printable but, or, or legal but, or acceptable in the air, uh, but uh, <laughs> people should know that even when Israel was not doing these uh, assaults on Gaza, they were have been blowing up houses all the time. I was there in 2004 and we went and saw a, a flour, um, uh, not a flour mill, but a, a large house or a large barn, not barn, but uh, where a man had been growing flowers for export and they had destroyed that. We went down to Rafa near the border between Egypt and uh, yeah. Gaza. And the night before, the Israelis had blown up four buildings and for no reason. Um, and we walked among the, the wreckage there, and then we walked a little close to the border, and we could hear the pings of Israeli sniper fire. Right. It was right around the corner. I mean, if, uh, that they do this all the time, and it, and it doesn't get reported. They're, Palestinians are being killed all the time. If you go too close to a fence, you get killed, you get shot. They made a huge worldwide to-do about a Corporal Gilad Shalit a few years ago, back in 2005, 2006. He, they say he was kidnapped by Palestinians. Well, soldiers don't get kidnapped. They get captured. Kids get kidnapped, civilians get kidnapped, but only Israelis get kidnapped. Huh? Uh, so the day before that had happened, the Israelis had come into Gaza and kidnapped two brothers who were not fighters. So the next day, Gilad Shalit was captured in retaliation, but you never heard about the two brothers. Uh. And then, uh, of course, you mentioned Gaza being an outdoor prison. This has been said by journalists. 
I mean, Western journalists, not just by Palestinians, it is. They have controlled all the outlets to Gaza. And, of course, Egypt collaborates with, with Israel oh. uh, and has collaborated through Mubarak, and now it's even worse. Yes. Um, the, the, when Israel got out of Camp David Agreement, was taking Egypt out of the equation and letting Israel do what it wished with its neighbors, the Palestinians and the Lebanese. And let me interrupt you for yeah. a second. Uh, there may be viewers watching or saying, what has this got to do with me? Okay, and uh, first off, it's your tax dollars that are providing all this military aid Talk about the, the money the, that Israel provides, I mean, that the U.S. provides the, the, Israel the US and Egypt. And Egypt, because it's actually part of the same as it. Right. In order to secure both Israel's and Egypt, Egypt's signature on the Camp David Agreement in 1978, Jimmy Carter made a deal that Israel will get so much money every year and Egypt would get about three quarters of it. Same. Uh, the difference is Israel gets its money in cash every October, which means the U.S. Treasury has to borrow money to give the cash to Israel, and the Israelis deposit the money in, in a bank account and get interest on it. But Egyptians don't, don't, don't get it like that. Uh, no other country gets their aid like that. Uh, actually, right now, what they're doing is they get uh, close to $3 billion a year in weapons. So, so when you read a thing in a headline says, Israel have purchased U.S. weapons. That's, they're not purchasing U.S. weapons. They're being given U.S. weapons. It's like me. It's like a, someone gives their son uh, money to go out and buy Christmas presents to give back. You know, it's, it, it's, it helps to subsidize the U.S. armaments industry, but it's not, that's not the reason because the, the purchases of Saudi Arabia are far, far surpass anything that we give to Israel. What it does, we're tied into Israel so much uh, intelligence sharing, and, and, but the most important thing we do is we protect Israel in the international forum. So in the UN, every country may vote against Israel on a resolution on the Security Council, but the U.S. will veto it every time. Will veto it, and uh, what this does is gives is protects Israel, and we have, we have our U.S. politicians saying that there's no line between the U.S. and Israel, what it does is make America hated around the world, particularly in the Arab world. Of course. Not by the, the leaders, but by the, the people. The people, yeah. And, uh, but then let's take the war in Iraq. There was a group uh, of neocons, Jewish neocons, who wrote a paper for Benjamin Netanyahu in 1995 called The Clean Break, in which they advised... Netanyahu, who was running for office then, uh, to break off negotiations with the Palestinians and to take out Saddam Hussein and go after and break up the Arab countries, Israel's enemies. Well, they, they didn't do that, but these same men, Richard uh, Pearl, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, uh, Douglas Spife, uh, David Wormser, they were all key parts of something called the Project for a New American Century, oh, which then was founded at about the same time. And, they, and the first thing that they called for was to take out Saddam Hussein. And they also said that uh, America should be so strong that it would be stronger than any, what all of its enemies combined, any other combination of countries combined, and Israel would be like, Israel would be like our, our lieutenant during. And predominantly Jewish, the neocons were predominantly Jewish. Uh, and this was not unimportant because they, they came from a certain position of uh, being supportive of Soviet Jewry. Being Jewish was very important in their lives. And so they wanted, uh, when 9-11 uh, came about, we won't get to that, but when 9-11 came about, this is the opportunity to Pearl Harbor that PNAC claimed was necessary to get the American people behind a, an enduring war. And they went after Afghanistan first, but they really wanted to go for Iraq. And the CIA was not coming up with the information, the intelligence right. that would justify it, so they established within the Defense Department the Office of Special Plans. 
Now, Wormser, Fife, Wolfowitz, and Pearl were, went all into the Bush administration. Right. So they were the ones who were really orchestrating it. And when the war appeared to be successful, both Wolfowitz and Pearl took credit for it. But, but now... Iraq is a disaster. Huh? Let's just cut to the chase. Iraq is a disaster. They destroyed Iraq. Yes. But it's not, it wasn't a disaster for the neocons because their plans were based on a plan by a former Israeli military officer and strategic planner, Oded Inan, who wrote a pamphlet, or not a pamphlet, but a paper um, back in the early 80s called A Strategy for Israel in the 80s. And the goal of Israel would be is to break up all their Arab enemies into their religious factions. Ooh. This is what in They've fact succeeded. has happened. They've succeeded. They've succeeded. So it's a disaster for the United States, for our national interest, however you want to cut it. Iraq is a disaster. We have soldiers who will be getting medical treatment right. and dying and committing suicide like every day for years. But for the neocons, it was a success because they got rid of Saddam Hussein, destabilized right. the Middle East. They got rid of, uh, of Gaddafi, right. even though I was no fan of Gaddafi. Got a, and now you've they, got a refugee problem that you know, is refugee horrible. Problem. Gaddafi was getting paid billions of dollars from European countries to keep immigrants from emigrating to um, right. New yeah, York. he made a deal. I remember that. And and he made, this was actually in the European papers, but it was in the American press. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you're having all these wars, in which America's hands are deep in them, forcing people to go and and leave because if, there's, there's this, actually no this, work. There's multi but millions be now they'll fleeing be, Syria, yeah. fleeing fleeing Iraq, fleeing fleeing. Every the North Africa, Somalia, Every, Yemen. I mean, it's it's horrible. You, see, you take Somalia. Somalia, some years ago, during some of the struggles, after the Black Hawk Down situation, a group called the Islamic Court, I remember, they were religious, I remember them, took over Somalia and they pacified it, and there was no more killing. I know. And people were supporting the Islamic Court. The United States hired Ethiopia to go and invade. I remember uh, Somalia and destroyed that. And, and, and that's and, and there's not a word of this in the American press. Yeah, you don't learn anything about it. So the United States, with uh, with the Africom, we have this African command in there. Right. Well, that's where we are training that's soldiers. Basically, why they hired. Uh, or selected Obama is to help them set up Africa. Well, actually, Ooh, you know, better. Obama, I believe, was selected for a more important reason. He well, I'm was, sure it wasn't the only reason. The most important reason was they knew, it turned out, there was a large article in the March of 2009 after Obama was elected, big article, two pages, that they knew in 2008 that the banks of Wall Street would be bailed out. That meant Whoever was going to become president would have to do it. Now, the Republican base hates Wall Street. The Democratic base dislikes Wall Street. But you would have had the American people more united than ever before against the bailing out of Wall Street and the banks. So who comes along to, to make sure Obama wins? The pacification. Sarah Palin. Oh. The neocons put Sarah Palin in as the vice president for the Republicans. They, the neocon magazine called Weekly Standard, William Crystal, who's a feature on Fox News, one of the co-founders of the Project for New American Century and a successor of the Foreign Policy Initiative, and the and founder of the Emergency Committee for Israel. Uh, they went to visit Sarah Palin in Alaska and came back and pushed her to be the vice president. And people would say, we don't want, this president is dangerous, right? And then, I believe, and one day the evidence may come out, that they had the Tea Party ready as a package to go into action. Wow. This was not some spontaneous thing that popped up around the country. The Koch brothers were behind it. These and, are two multi-billionaires yeah, that bankrolled right. the elections. That's right. That's the right. selections. And so, 
the origin of the Tea Party have yet to be spelled K O C H, by the way, not yeah, K O C H. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, but why this all means something is the Iraq War destabilized the Middle East. The taking out of Saddam uh, destabilized the region because he was very secular. <coughs> he was very secular. And they've gone after all the secular people there. Gaddafi was secular. Right. Uh, I, I'm not a friend. I wasn't a supporter of Gaddafi. And Assad is secular. They really wanted to put this element of religion, religious fundamentalism, up on the agenda. And this is what's happened. Exactly. Because, <coughs> and then they've got the right-wing uh, evangelicals here supporting the... the uh, Israel. Israelis. And they, there are about 20 million right of Right-wing Israelis. So they, take, they make sure the Republicans are solidly on board. Right. Uh, then you have this guy, Senator Tom Cotton. He's the one who, who sent the letter, got 47 senators to send a letter to um, Iran telling them that if any deal that Obama would make, they would overthrow. Who is Tom Cotton? He came out of nowhere. He actually has been an officer in Iraq, but I doubt if he saw any combat. And he was losing the election. And the Emergency Committee for Israel gave him $1 million. And that $1 million was enough to buy the kind of advertising that won him the election and the job in the Senate. So he is paying back that $1 million. Yeah. Now, you don't see that in the newspapers at all. It was once briefly in the newspapers, but now it's no longer in the newspapers. Right. And Tom Cotton is the one who's really been pushing for Israel to be uh, recognized by Iran as, as a Jew. And speaking of Israel and Iran and this whole nuclear thing, it, uh, people forget that, uh, or don't know because it's kept so quiet, that uh, Israel has about 300 nuclear warheads. 300. And, and there's another warheads myth about this. sitting right there. Is that there's a story goes around is that Richard Nixon made an agreement with Golda Meir, who was the Prime Minister of Israel, that she, that, that if, if Israel did not test its nuclear weapons, the United States would not mention them. This is just a myth, because when Jimmy Carter was president, mm -hmm. Israel tested a weapon in the South Atlantic, supposedly with, with South Africa, and in 1989, I just found in my paper files recently that the NBC had a three-day report on, on, Israel, on Israel's um, uh, testing in Israel of a, of a, of, of, of weapon, a nuclear weapon with South Africa. But the thing was, it is against U.S. law to give any money to any country that tests nuclear weapons outside of the nuclear non-proliferation agreement. And this, is, and this is the reason that it, all this money going to Israel is against the law. And the U.S., <laughs> in February, the Defense Department, under pressure by a friend of mine, Grant Smith, released documents that showed that the U.S. had all the details about Israel's atomic weapons program back in 1987, including their building of the hydrogen bomb. Wow. And yet, this is not in the newspapers. It was released in the newspapers. It's available online. But not a single mainstream paper would cover it, nor democracy now. Okay. Um, we were talking earlier about the new justice minister of Israel. Uh, will you talk about her, Eilat uh, Shaked? Eilat uh, Shaked is a young, proud, very pretty uh, Israeli woman who speaks like a Nazi. Uh, during <laughs> she the, sure does. During the um, assault on Gaza, she read an article, put it on Facebook, and endorsed an article that called the entire Palestinian people the enemy and called for the destruction, including of the elderly and the women, of its cities and villages, and to take out the women because the babies they would produce, the Palestinian babies, are snakes. Little snakes. She was calling for genocide, and she is now the new justice minister of Israel, but in Israel it means just us. 
Oh, for sure. And you would not see a single word about this in the U.S. mainstream media, which is controlled, dominated, intimidated, however you want to put it, by the Zionist establishment in this country. So she, she's basically called for genocide she's against called the for Palestinian genocide. people. And in Europe, they don't have the same censorship of the media. Okay, we have about just a couple minutes left, and I wanted to talk sure. about the International Criminal Court, which uh, uh, Pat, uh, the PLO has just joined, the Palestinians have just joined, right? And uh, they, they, one of the first things that they, apparently, uh, there's a preliminary um, examination um, uh, that they've accepted um, uh, with regard to the uh, Mavi, uh, Mavi Mamara, Mamara, Mamara yeah. uh, the, the uh, flotilla where 10 people were killed uh, uh, back in 2010. And uh, the Israelis just, I remember that <laughs> well, uh, they climbed on board and just shot people dead right there. There was a video which, which showed uh, this young Turkish-American who the fact that he was a Turkish American, America didn't mean anything here. Only, oh, yes, only certain Americans uh, uh, are get honored um, by the government. But he was shot and killed, and the ICC, the National Criminal Court, is going to take that case. Right. This has nothing to do with the Palestinians, however. This is the Turks are bringing that case. Oh. Oh, well, I thought that um, the pa well, the Palestinians are members of the... The Kuma. Palestinians are members, but Abbas has been a collaborator with Israel from the very beginning, and he is not planning to bring... He sabotaged mm -hmm. the Goldstone Report uh, after, after the, the attack on, uh, previous attack on Gaza. And the Goldstone Report, very briefly? It, it, it was a, by a and South it, African uh, judge uh, it, talking about Israel's war crimes in Gaza the previous... Or the previous war in Gaza. Right. They've had three in six years. If you're, if you're a child in Gaza, you've known three assaults in the air in six years. This is, this should be condemned. Yes. By and every decent human being, but the U.S. Congress has given. Jeffrey, last words. We're yes. we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us on Freedom Is a Constant Struggle. Say a few more words. We got to. Well, thank. Oh you. no, we don't. Thank you for tuning in to Freedom, and. Uh, Oh, thank you to um, Sydney. Sydney Madison, and thank you for joining us, and uh, all power to the people. And keep on keeping on, Keel. You were great.